may, uh, we'll have a little time to, to delve into some of the details as well in our discussion, but I want to turn it over to Hans Reikov to give us a little bit of perspective on the um, experiment that, um, or the experience that Novartis has had in marketing the drug um, Coartem in the malaria context. Thank you, Quinton. So let me just get this. Yeah, and then it's here. Good morning. Um, thank you, Quinton, for, organi for organizing this uh, meeting and for inviting me. Um, I'm very privileged to be here. Um, I've been working on this program, the Malaria Initiative within Novartis, for uh, well over a decade um, and started really at the time when uh, this was actually a very marginal program. It was marginal at the time. Uh, there was a, you know, a groundbreaking memorandum of understanding in place between Novartis and the World Health Organization, uh, but that was actually a piece of paper. It, it wasn't really something that had been operationalized in any meaningful way. So the question is, is this a best practice that is scalable and replicable? I put a question mark, really, because um, you, will, you will see that there are a number of points that we learned across you know, this, this journey that we as a company would not be willing to replicate in exactly the same way. The good news is that if you look at the World Malaria Report, that in the last 15 years, uh, the disease burden from malaria, especially mortality numbers, have come down significantly. Uh, estimates are that more than 6 million deaths have been averted between 2000 and 2015. And, and a great deal is really thanks to uh, you know, higher rates of international funding, as we also saw, was a key drive in the H, uh, programs, HIV AIDS programs, but also um, you know, the work of, of companies making bed nets, making medicines, making diagnostics, that has really come a long way together with partners in countries to make those available. Um, so for Novartis, the, the vision is really um, to, you know, collaborate with everybody who has that same vision to end malaria for good. Uh, some people say in my generation, um, depends you know, which perspective you still have. Uh, I think there's sometimes more optimism than realism, but I think there's a good sense of, of urgency that we need to make this happen and need to, make, and need to really go beyond this objective of reducing, controlling malaria because as long as you don't eliminate it, this disease can be around there forever in a causing death as it is today. Every two minutes, a child dies from malaria. Can you imagine a very simple to, to treat disease, but still causing so much havoc? Uh, we do this as a company by basically pursuing four strategies. It's making the life-saving treatment quartum available in the right quantity, quality, the right packaging, the right formulation, um, improving access, uh, making sure the prices are right, and we'll talk about that. Um, supportive interventions with healthcare workers, with disease awareness programs for communities, for school children, and disease education, and with an eye to what is going to be needed at some point in time, new medicines, because parasites have proven to be able to outsmart any drug that is being thrown at them. So over the years, um, we've been quite successful in many ways. Um, Novartis was the very first company to come up with an artemisinin-based combination therapy in one single pill. Um, and I should really give credit uh, to our uh, Chinese partners, who are the ones that um, made the invention as, I would say, a byproduct of the Vietnam War, for those who are not familiar with you. But that was really the time when the, uh, the research in China to find new antimalarials was actually kick-started. Um, over the years, uh, cumulatively, we have uh, supplied well over 750 million coartum treatments. Um, you know, in Europe, there's a European championship for football ongoing. And just to kind of give an idea of what this represents in terms of pills. So, 
750 million treatments, if you put all those pills next to each other on the green of a football area, you can fill more than 100 football fields and turn them from green into yellow, which is the color of these pills. Or alternatively, if you imagine the Eiffel Tower in Paris and the amount of steel uh, made uh, to, to, to erect this tower, um, these pills weigh three times as much as, as the steel of the Eiffel Tower. Um, now, that is for today. We are also having you know, an eye to the future with uh, two molecules currently for malaria treatment in research in phase 2A and phase 2B. Um, and we continue to support um, malaria teams in, in ministries of health, but also in the, in the health facilities more downstream in the health care system to provide support with malaria di diagnosis and treatments. Um, a number of considerations have really informed our work in the malaria initiative. Um, clearly, uh, obtaining marketing authorizations um, with well over 70 countries in the malaria endemic world has been uh, quite, quite an undertaking. Um, in some places, we don't have offices, uh, so we need to work through different mechanisms to, to try and get that or, uh, organized. Segmenting the market, very important. Um, we have come to realize that the offering that we initially went out with wasn't really adapted to the uh, diversity of, of the markets that we were serving. Again, the formulation. Um, we talk about very small pills, um, but they are still too big for a baby or a young child to swallow. So as we launched the program, it took a number of years for us to actually improve the formulation to make it really pediatric friendly uh, as a dispersible tablet that is easy to take and, and actually sweet tasting, unlike every intermalarial tablet, which is typically tasting very bitter. Um, we also worked on packaging, uh, realizing that the packaging as such is actually a vehicle and can be used um, in the dialogue between the healthcare professional and the patient or the caregiver um, as a means of conveying not only when and how the medicine shall be taken, but also why you need to comply to the full three-day course of treatment. Uh, basically explaining very pictorially that, you know, even after two days you might find yourselves, you know, healed from malaria infection. Actually, if you would analyze the blood, there is most likely still going to be a few circulating parasites. And those ones you need to take out by taking your third day of dosing. So very schematically, we also, um, you know, incorporate that into the, into the packaging. Tiered pricing, um, very important topic. Um, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, the markup in the distribution chain, um, challenging, of course, uh, because there's only so much that a manufacturer of medicines can actually do to, to really influence that. So here comes then the, the, the scheme that we developed um, you know, during the journey. In the beginning of the journey, um, basically, the pyramid was much more simplified. It was only a you know, a bottom part, which was what we call the public sector, government-led and NGO and donor-funded business. And that was the top part, you know, the premium market, where perhaps 3 to 5% of people living in malaria endemic countries can go to purchase out-of-pocket uh, medicines to treat a disease. But in between, we didn't really have the right offering. Um, and so... You know, it was really at some point in, I think, when was it, 2004, that the Institute of Medicine published this report, um, Buying Time, Saving Lives. Uh, a program to really uh, get everybody thinking, how can you um, provide a, a kind of a global subsidy to then make medicines that are being sold in private sector outlets available to people at very affordable prices. Now, the report has been gathering dust, if you will, for a number of years. Uh, it took really until 2010 that uh, finally an experiment was launched uh, to make antimalarial medicines, particularly these artemisinin and base combination therapies, available uh, at an affordable retail price 
thanks to initially approximately 90% or even 95% of donor subsidies. Um, so the, the, the mechanism was here the following. It was the global fund that set aside monies to um, send to manufacturers of these products, uh, let's say 95% of the price of the medicine, whereas then a distributor in Africa would place an order with the manufacturers and would receive an invoice just for 5% of the cost of the medicine. And the idea then was that the, the distributor in Africa was able to bring in this medicine at a very low cost and then pass it on into the uh, distribution chain, making hopefully reasonable but not too excessive margins so that then in the end, at the pharmacy level, patients could actually buy a life-saving antimalarial medicine, which had the right quality around it, uh, for you know, a very affordable price. Um, and so that was, that was started as an experiment in 2010. Um, it, it has worked or it has not worked. I mean, it depends on how you look at it. Um, one of the shortcomings, one could say, is that in the private sector still today, there is hardly any practice of diagnosing first to confirm your infection of malaria and then treating. So there is most likely quite significant over-treatment. So that, that's probably one of the downsides of, of this program. Um, but it allowed actually to serve kind of an emerging middle class of patients that would not want to seek healthcare in a public structure where they might you know, have to wait in line or may not get the right service, or they might be confronted with stockouts. Um, and here they could actually pay out of pocket at a very you know, reasonable price. Now, this is basically the overview of the, of the numbers of treatments that we have sold of Coartum over the years. Um, as I said, this memorandum of understanding with the WHO started in 2001. Um, there was really no government at that time really interested in, in taking this type of medicines, although there was already quite significant uh, concern about treatment resistance against the older um, treatments like chloroquine and sulfidoxin and pyrimethamin. Uh, but the absence of, of basically interest to, to uptake this type of new, new treatment was really because there was, there was no donor funding for it. And, and so the government said, well, you know, we can't really afford to change our treatment guidelines, even though in a country like Zambia by then, you know, half of the patients that were treated with chlor chloroquine didn't get a cure and went either into severe malaria or, or, or you know, ultimately didn't really survive it. So it took, in fact, that, that donor funding to really uh, propel the uptake of this type of, of treatments. Um, the declining trend is really driven by uh, mostly uh, the advent of generic uh, suppliers uh, who, have, who have joined this battle um, as of uh, 2008. Um, here is actually uh, an example of one of the coordinate packages. It really depends uh, you know, on the body weight, whether you take two pills per dose or, or less or, or more. Um, but it also has this, uh, this kind of you know, row here um, where you see those parasites, really what I was just talking about, to really encourage people to take that very last few doses. Uh, because this is one of the challenges with these type of treatments. They are so powerful and so quick acting that people might want to save them for a next infection uh, to, to save some money. Now, coming to um, you know, some of the, 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 key, the key success factors, the key learnings. Um, indeed, the dual branding, that was what we initially started with. You know, the, the drug is also available um, here in the United States, by the way. You can buy it in small bottles, 24 tablets, uh, for an adult dose. Uh, you can buy it in, in, in Australia, in Europe. Um, and, and there the pricing is, uh, is, you know, kind of comparable to what you would take if you go to a malaria endemic country, um, you know, if you would take a prophylactic treatment, whereas this is not prophylactic, this is more a standby treatment, so really intended for Western travelers as a safety blanket in case you are somewhere and you think you have malaria and there is no medical care around, you start treatment and you, you, 
you get a diagnosis later. Um, the implementation of the intra-country differential pricing proved very important. We actually had, in some countries still have today, four price points uh, going from you know, public sector facilities um, up to the different levels in the private sector. Um, I personally find that it is difficult to maintain those four price points. Three price points are probably more logic to achieve uh, in the long term. Um, the financial sustainability actually has been a huge challenge for this program. Um, I should say that if you really take everything into account, that means also the early work of, of research and development on Quartum, um, then, then the financial sustainability is still not there, you know, 5, 15, 16 years after launch of this program. Um, if you take that out and look, you know, quarter by quarter, we have just recently actually been able to pay our own bills entirely. This is the point I was going to make. That's so, something that you know, we hadn't really expected when we were starting on the program. And certainly as we are contemplating for you know, new generation of materials, we will have to, uh, to approach things differently in that respect. Um, clearly the success factor is, is, is the partnerships. We would not have been able to achieve what we achieved with the malaria program without partnerships across all um, phases in, in the value chain, be it in research and development. I uh, just wanted to say that, for example, when we improved the formulation to treat infants and children with malaria, it was Medicines for Malaria Venture who um, gave some catalytic funding that also then um, helped senior management in our company to, to make the decision and say, okay, you know, we go and, and continue to pay for development, even though this is not, not a financially attractive area. Um, now, over time, the challenges, and you've seen on, on that pyramid, we have gotten over the year an explosion of the number of different quartum packaging, uh, because we, of course, are serving very different uh, tiers in the socioeconomic pyramid. Um, and then you get the next um, kind of country customization requests, like for example in Nigeria, where um, the uh, health authority has mandated manufacturers of certain classes of medicines, including antimalarials and antibiotics, to put on a, a small kind of code or a sticker, kind of a scratch thing that you need to scratch, and then a 12-digit number appears, which you can then SMS toll-free, and then it actually helps to authenticate the products. Um, that comes with a cost, clearly. If other countries would expect the same, this would, you know, drive cost up even, even further. Uh, it's also difficult for us to kind of, you know, plan all these different, you know, quantities of packs. Uh, you have less flexibility. There was a time, you know, when the Global Fund was just starting with its malaria disbursement uh, practices. Um, you know, things went very slow, for example, in country one. And things went a little bit more, you know, smoothly in another country. And so our huge stock, at some point I should say, we had 23 million quartum treatments on stock without a firm purchase order behind it. Imagine the kind of the cost and the working capital and the risk of a product that only has 24 months of shelf life. Um, so that flexibility with all those multiple packaging differentiation is, is becoming a challenge for us. Um, we've also, and that was actually, you know, surprising really, um, you know, seen that product diversion um, has, has become, you know, a bit of an issue in a number of countries and even counterfeits. So we thought, you know, we are selling this, you know, at such a rock bottom low price, but even counterfeiters would, would move into this market and, and try to, um, to, to get some margins there. Um, so financial sustainability, that's for us a, a key consideration. Uh, the forecasting uncertainty, um, you know, has been very huge and, and has, you know, caused a lot of concern because it's such an artificial market. You know, ultimately, 90% of the products of the quartum medicines that are being sold are either 100% or around 60 to 70% donor funded. So, so you get a very distorted way of, you know, of, of ordering and supplying in a way. And then the question that we ask ourselves is now that there is much more, let's say, generic competition in the place, 
what do malaria programs in Africa and what would what do donors you know find of a value in our capacity building programs that we offer you know free of charge alongside with the the product uh, uh, transactions and, and and that is actually something which you know in the, at the end of the day as people say you know price is king and and so those additional value programs that we're doing that are costing money don't get uh, you know as much of a valuation so these are just a few thoughts that i would like to leave you with but um, we remain determined to make sure that no child shall die from malaria in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. That's terrific. And so, so now we have two potential models on the table. Um, we have, um, please, Prashant. Um, uh, you know, we, we've